Thank you. Um, I want to thank Martin um, for inviting me to talk with you here today and for that really lovely introduction. I also want to t thank Jennifer Hung for everything that was involved in actually getting me here, um, which I always really appreciate. Um, a very brief agenda for what I'm going to do this morning. Um, I'm, we're experiencing some problems, generally speaking, not necessarily at this institution, um, but at many institutions. In thinking about how promotion and tenure um, processes and policies ought to evolve um, in, in the coming years. And some of these problems are being surfaced um, in, in some cases by the digital work that scholars are producing today. Um, I'm going to talk through a few of the problems that I've been seeing at various institutions and then um, present a, a highly opinionated um, set of principles that I would love to see applied to our processes and policies in order to make them do a bit better the kind of work that we really want that process to be doing. Um, and the largest and in fact most central of the problems that I've been seeing in our tenure and promotion processes and policies today is that they're kind of riven with internal contradictions. Um, contradictions that are in some cases inevitable, um, but that in many cases are engineered into the process um, as we employ it for what seem like very good reasons. Um, so among these inevitable contradictions is the fact that the policies that we're talking about, um, the process that we're talking about, the, the tenure and promotion review process, applies to a vanishingly small population, right? It's, it's not something that, you know, is, is very widespread. And so it seems like it ought to be a relatively small problem in the life of an institution. And yet for that population to whom these policies apply, um, I mean, the policies can support or disrupt an entire career, and so they're of the highest possible stakes, um, which make the changes that we might want to see to the policies and standards that we're using in these processes seem like an insurmountably large obstacle to institutional change. Now, the enormity of this obstacle to institutional change is heightened by the contradiction between our tenure and promotion policies, institutional ownership, and their individual implementation. I mean, despite the fact that tenure and promotion reviews are conducted and overseen by people with agency within our institutions, a whole lot of times those people feel themselves to be powerless before institutional policy. Right? I would feel differently about this work, but the institution says I have to feel that way about it. Um, and as so many institutional policies and processes, they're intended to be neutral and systemic and impersonal, right? all in the name of being fair. And yet these policies are always deeply personal in their application, especially for the scholar who's undergoing the evaluation. Um, as a result of where the tenure and promotion process should at least in theory require scholars and administrators to exercise the greatest, most careful possible judgment, right? A judgment that is inevitably subjective. And we wind up for a whole lot of really good reasons creating and implementing processes that are as objective as possible. And that creates some challenges. Um, in order for those processes to be objective in their design and implementation, we often wind up turning away from assessments of the work's quality to assessments of its quantity. Um, and in other words, we, we end up counting things. Um, and we obsess about what counts and what it counts for, what it counts as. Now, one thing that you might note in all of these contradictions and concerns in promotion and tenure policies and processes is that none of them have very much to do with the changing nature of scholarship today or the growing role that digital scholarship plays, right? These are, these are contradictions that have been there for a long time. Um, but promotion, so in other words, promotion and tenure is, is always already problematic, as the French theorists might suggest. And the digital transitions that we're seeing today in how work gets done are likely only rendering those contradictions more visible. So given that, um, I think it would probably be a good idea for us to start by considering what it is that we're trying to do in the tenure and promotion review process itself, right? What, are, what we're trying to do in the first place so that we might find ways to best surface those purposes and principles in whatever our processes become. Now, we have long treated um, the tenure and promotion review as a sort of threshold exercise. 
um, an assessment of whether the candidate has done enough to qualify. And the result in too many cases of this particular treatment of the process is, I think, burnout and unhappiness in the associate rank. Um, there's a reason, after all, why The Onion found this funny. I don't know if you can read that. It says, newly tenured professor now inspired to work harder than ever. Um, <laughs> It's not just about the privileges of lifetime tenure producing entitled slackers. Um, assistant professors run the pre-tenure period as a race, and making it over the final hurdle too often collapse, of finding themselves exhausted, without focus and direction, depressed to discover that what's ahead of them is just more of the same track. Um, the problem really isn't the height of the hurdle or the length of the track. It's the notion that the pre-tenure period should be thought of as a race at all. It's right? something with a finish line at the end of which one will either have won or lost, but in any rate, it'll be done, um, rather than understanding it as being part of a career as a whole. Right? And I believe that we can find a way, a better way, of supporting and assessing the careers of junior faculty if we start by approaching the tenure review in a different way entirely. I'm thinking of it not as a threshold exercise, but instead as a milestone. Right, a moment of checking in with the progress of a much longer, more sustained, and more sustainable career. Now, this notion of the milestone comes to me in part from the ways that my, my now dean, Chris Long, and my associate dean, Bill Hart Davidson, have recently been talking with faculty at the College of Arts and Letters um, at Michigan State <coughs> University about charting their path to intellectual leadership. Now, charting this path requires first understanding what intellectual leadership is and how it might be changing um, in many of our fields and how it might change over the course of a career. And then establishing some steps to, to get to that, that marker of intellectual leadership. So early in a career, for instance, intellectual leadership might be about establishing a voice within the field. And later on, it might look more like um, helping other scholars establish their voices. But in every case, depending on the scholar's long-term goals, the steps along the path are going to be different. And some of these steps are smaller. They're like stepping stones, things that the, author, or that the scholar can control. Um, they're writing an article or submitting a grant proposal or what have you. And then there are larger steps toward the long-term goal, and these are the steps over which the scholar might not have full control. These are milestones, right? Publishing a book, which depends on the press actually being able to publish a book. Getting tenure, which depends on a review process that the scholar doesn't have full control over. So these, these are the milestones. They're those larger markers over the course of this path toward intellectual leadership. And however much these milestones might look at particular moments like end goals before we get to them in particular, they really are steps along the way. Um, the goal of intellectual leadership should remain further out on the horizon, you know, the, the, the entirety of the career as imagined. And so milestones like the tenure review provide a moment of checking in, right, to ensure that things are on course, that the path is working. <coughs> Now, taking this review requires us to stop and think about the shape of that career overall. Um, the promise of that distinguished career is, after all, what we hire junior faculty for, right? The promise that they will engage with their material and their colleagues and their students over the long term, that they'll use those engagements to come to some kind of prominence in their fields. The tenure review, at the end of the first <coughs> six years of those careers, should ideally not be a moment of determining whether those candidates have thus far done X quantity of work, where X is enough to safely earn tenure and then rest. Um, but rather, in an ideal universe, we should use the tenure review to ask whether the promise with which those candidates arrived is beginning to bear out. And I should say that again, beginning to bear out. Right? The most productive question that we can ask in the promotion and tenure review is not whether the full potential of a candidate has been achieved, but rather what has been, whether what has been done to this early point in a career, six years in, very early, um, gives us sufficient confidence in what's going to happen over the long haul that we want the colleague to remain a colleague, right? That we want them to do that work over the long haul with us for as long as possible. 
But in order to figure that out, um, the questions that we ask about the work can't focus solely on whether there's been enough of it, um, but rather need to focus on its importance, right? Its, its potential for impact, its quality. Um, we already reach out in the vast majority of cases to experts in the candidate's field, requesting their careful evaluation of the work and its significance, and reframing our own assessment practices to foreground not the quantity of work that's been done, but the ways that we see it beginning to have an impact on its field can really help us transform the exercise into one that supports our most important scholarly goals and values. Now, not incidentally, um, such a foregrounding of the potential for impact I think might help us more fairly evaluate the newer kinds of digital projects in which scholars, uh, many scholars today are engaging. But they also might encourage us to reassess a range of forms that go, of, of work that go undercredited, right? Um, encouraging us to acknowledge and properly value forms of intellectual labor that too often get shoved under the category of service to the field. Um, in my own area of the humanities, work like that includes translation, or the production of scholarly editions, or the editing of scholarly journals. None of these forms of, of work carries the same weight in most review processes as the scholarly monograph. And yet, I mean, just to pick up one of those examples, what more powerful position is there in shaping the, the future of a field than that of the journal editor? So, this is just one of the kinds of problems that we need to encounter. Um, but again, I, I want to emphasize that it's, it's not enough to simply add digital work or journal editing or what have you to the list of kinds of work that we accept for tenure and promotion. I mean, at least not, um, not least because the impulse is then to apply currently understood standards to those objects, right? Are there kinds of journals that count and kinds that don't? Um, does the journal have to have a specified impact factor? and so forth. I mean, even when we're more enlightened about our metrics um, for impact and we look at a broader range of what get referred to as alternative metrics, um, we run the risk of creating new modes of assessment that lead us increasingly toward objectivity, um, perhaps, but also increasingly toward impersonality, um, toward a kind of utilitarianism, and toward, I think, increasing rigidity. So instead, um, I want to approach the problem from a different direction, thinking less about better ways of conducting ostensibly neutral assessment in the tenure and promotion review, and more about ways of focusing on the things that we really care about. Um, this different mode of approach may require us, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my scrolling here. Um, this different mode of approach may require us to give up um, our reliance on some relatively easy, objective, quantitative measures in favor of seeking out more complex, sub subjective, qualitative judgments. Um, but I would suggest that these kinds of complex judgments about research in our fields are at the core of our job as scholars, and that we have a particular ethical res obligation to take responsibility for such judgments seriously. Now this different direction will also require us to think as flexibly as we can about how our practices should not only change now, but how they should continue to evolve as the work that junior scholars produce changes. Um, so what follows are a few principles, and as I said at the outset, some really admittedly highly opinionated <laughs> principles um, that we should consider in thinking about the policies and procedures um, that we might establish that will enable us to focus less on what counts and more on what we genuinely value in scholarly work. So the first of these um, is that we simply have to get past the but I don't know how to evaluate that kind of work stage of the process. Uh, many disciplinary organizations have developed standards and guidelines for the evaluation of new kinds of scholarly work, whether it's the evaluation of public community engaged scholarly projects or the evaluation of digital work. Um, for instance, the, the MLA's Committee on Information Technology put forward its first set of best practices back in 2000 and then updated those policies, um, those guidelines in 2012. <coughs> And the organization has also held numerous workshops on evaluation processes for digital work at its annual convention. 
And the AHA um, College Art Association, 4Cs, all of them have similar documents and support available. There are also um, some really excellent university policies that can be emulated out there, including um, uh, policy at Emory College um, within Emory University and at um, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Now, despite the existence of these excellent criteria and models for evaluating new work, however, um, many faculty, and especially those who have long worked in traditional forms, really do need some support in beginning to um, read and interpret and engage with new kinds of work that's being done in the field, and in particular with digital projects and other new forms of scholarship. Um, this need is, of course, what led the, uh, to the MLA's workshops that I mentioned. And there have been similar kinds of workshops that have been held at the summer seminars of the Association of Departments of English and the Association of Departments of Foreign Languages. There have also been a series of NEH-funded summer institutes on this question of evaluating digital scholarship. And then on the local level, um, my own College of Arts and Letters at MSU has begun holding regular workshops with both candidates and <coughs> chairs um, on the review process, surfacing their questions and concerns and supporting faculty in really producing the best possible environment okay. for this sort of evaluation. All right, we can do it. There we go. Now, supporting evaluators in the process of learning how to engage with these new kinds of work is crucial um, precisely because the work under review has to be dealt with as it is, right, as itself. Um, more or less every year, I hear reports from scholars whose work is web-based, um, but who've been asked to print out and three-hole punch that work in order to get it into the binder that they have to submit um, for tenure and promotion. Or the, the more contemporary version of this is to take the web-based project and turn it into a PDF in order to submit it through the dossier system. Um, and needless to say, eliminating the interaction involved in web-based projects undermines the very thing that they're trying to do. Um, so as the MLA guidelines frame it, um, we need to, in these processes, ensure that we're respecting medium specificity, right? Really engaging with the new work in the ways that the form itself requires. This um, also applies, um, I think, to scholars themselves. In the same way that the work demands to be dealt with on its own terms, it's crucial that tenure review processes engage with the candidates that we've actually hired, rather than trying to transform them into someone else. Um, while it's tempting to advise junior scholars to take the safer road to tenure, by adhering to traditional standards and practices in their work, right? You know, go ahead and publish the book first. Um, this advice runs the risk of derailing really genuinely transformative projects. And in all, in all cases, but perhaps especially when candidates have been hired into positions that are focused on new forms of teaching and research, or when they've been hired precisely because of the transformative work that they've been doing, um, they need to be supported in charting that path toward intellectual leadership, right? And in creating that support, <coughs> it's particularly important to guard against doubling the workload on the candidate by requiring them both to do the digital work and to publish in more traditional venues. Um, this is a recipe for exhaustion and frustration, and candidates should really be encouraged to focus on the forms of work that represent the greatest promise for impact in their fields. Now, my emphasis on supporting the candidates um, that you have doesn't mean that those candidates shouldn't have to persuade their senior colleagues of the importance of the work that they're doing. Um, scholars working in innovative modes and formats really must be able to articulate the reasons for and the significance of their work to a range of traditional audiences, um, not least their own campus mentors. And in theory, at, we, at least, this is the case for all scholars, right? It's the purpose that the personal statement in the tenure dossier is meant to serve. Uh, but for scholars working in non-traditional formats, there's an additional need to explain the work to others and to give others the context for understanding it. But the most important piece of this is that that process can't begin with, but really needs to culminate in the personal statement. 
um, throughout the pre-tenure period. Candidates should be given opportunities to present their work to their colleagues, such that they have lots of experience explaining their work and ample responses to their work by the time the tenure review begins. And they also need champions, mentors who, having examined the work, having come to understand its value, who will help them continue to mentor up by arguing on, be on behalf of the work among their colleagues. So every field has its ways of measuring impact. Um, and the measures that are used in one field don't automatically translate to another. Um, a, a colleague of mine whose PhD is in literature and who began her career as a digital humanist, still is a digital humanist, um, but is now in a position that's half situated in an English department and half in an information science department. And when she came up for tenure, she was being reviewed by both units. Um, her information science colleagues, in starting her tenure review, calculated her H index, and it was abysmal. Um, but the good news is that they stopped and they went on to calculate the H indexes of all of the top figures in the digital humanities and discovered that they were all equally terrible. Um, <laughs> metrics like that, that work in one field, the H index, the citation count, whatever kind of metric your field may rely upon, they simply don't apply across fields because of the ways that communication differs from one to another. So it's really necessary that we recognize the distinctive measures of impact that are used in particular fields and assess work in those fields accordingly. As those metrics indicate, um, we tend to like numbers in our assessment processes. Um, they feel concrete and objective, and some of them are demonstrably bigger than others. Um, but the problem is that we have a tendency to count things that are countable. Right? And too often, um, if, if things can't be counted, they wind up not counting. Um, it's, there's an enormous range of really significant data that just simply can't be captured or understood quantitatively. Um, take citation counts, for instance. Um, these kinds of metrics can tell us how often an article has been referred to in the subsequent literature, but they can't tell us whether the article is being praised or buried in those citations, um, whether it's being built on or whether it's being debunked. So while I'm glad that problematic metrics like journal impact factor are gradually being replaced with a much more sophisticated range of article level and other alternative metrics, I still want us to be a bit cautious about how we use those numbers. And I think this includes web-based metrics, right? Um, I love talking about the hits and downloads that various projects of mine have received. I mean, it can be really affirming, um, but those numbers don't necessarily indicate how closely the work is being attended to, how it's influencing future work in the field, and so forth. And those numbers aren't comparable across various fields and subfields, um, because those fields and subfields have different sizes. So if we're going to use quantitative metrics in the review process, they need really careful interpretation and analysis. And even better, they should be accompanied by a range of qualitative data um, that captures the reception and engagement with the candidate's work in action. Now, it is by and large um, the external reviewers that we've relied upon to produce the qualitative assessment of the tenure dossier. <coughs> Um, these experts are generally well-placed, more senior members of the candidate's subfield who are asked to evaluate the quality of the work on its own terms, right? as well as the, the place that work has within the current discourses of the subfield. And where candidates present dossiers that include non-traditional work, however, I think we really need to, to be careful to ensure that we're seeking out external reviewers who are able to assess not just the work's content, um, as if it were the equivalent of a journal article or a monograph, but also its formal aspects, um, accounting for the technical value of the work and the significance that that technical value has for the field. And this kind of medium-specific review, I would argue, is necessary for all forms of non-traditional work. A candidate whose dossier includes a translation should have at least one qualified reviewer asked to focus on the quality and significance of the translation itself. 
And a candidate who's, whose dossier includes journal editing should have one qualified external reviewer who's able to talk about the quality of the editing. Similarly with community engaged scholarship. We need senior scholars who really are invested in and understand the particular challenges of community engaged research um, in order to do that work and understand its significance for the field. That having been said, um, the external college to assess the work of a candidate are often in the best place to evaluate the quality of the work, its place within the subfield, its significance and its reception, and so forth. Um, but all too often, these reviewers are called upon by institutions or simply taken upon themselves <coughs> um, to make judgments that are outside the scope of their expertise or the scope of what they've been asked to do in the course of the review. I mean, it would be best for institutions to refrain from asking, or even specifically to enjoin external reviewers from indicating whether a candidate's work would merit tenure at their institution, um, or whether a candidate is among the top scholars in their field. And these kinds of comparisons rely on false equivalences among institutions and among scholars, and they're really invidious at best. Um, even more, I think departments need to use the judgments of those experts to inform their own judgment rather than to supplant it. Um, departments know their internal circumstances and the values of the institution in ways that external reviewers might not. And while the members of a, department, a departmental tenure review body might not be experts in candidates' specific area of interest, Bringing in such experts really shouldn't absolve the department of responsibility for exercising um, those members' own judgments, including engaging directly with the work themselves. Now, the desire to externalize judgment, whether by relying on <coughs> quantitative metrics or on the assessment of external reviewers, <coughs> is really understandable. I mean, we want our processes to be as uncontroversial, as scrupulous, and therefore as objective as possible. And there are certain kinds of subjective judgments, um, such as those around collegiality or fit, um, that shouldn't have any place in our reviews. Um, but aside from those issues, we really need to recognize that all judgment is inherently subjective. I mean, it's only by surfacing and acknowledging and questioning our own presuppositions that we can find our way to a position that's both subjective and equitable. Um, it's a kind of work that scholars, and especially those in the qualitative social sciences and the humanities, should be well equipped to do, um, as it's the kind of inquiry that we bring to our own subject matter. And moreover, and this is really something that deserves uh, an entire talk of its own, um, we need to, to think a little bit differently about peer review. Very often at institutions, Peer review is the thing, the criterion that makes something count for tenure or not. Um, and we really need to, to recognize that it's not a singular objective marker, right? There isn't one way in which peer review is done. There's not even one appropriate way in which peer review ought to be done. <coughs> Many publications and projects are experimenting with modes of review that are providing richer feedback and interaction than the standard double-blind process. And then there's a whole range of kinds of work from digital projects um, that may experience a moment of peer review at the point at which a grant application is reviewed, for instance, but the project is so inseparable from its publication that there isn't a moment of peer review um, prior to publication, right? Doing the work requires the work to become public in a way that, that elides peer review. Um, similarly with community engaged research, um, the nature of what constitutes peer review in that work is, is radically different from what we might think of in terms of traditional scholarly communication. So we really need to think about these kinds of projects and the nature of peer review and assess them on their own merits, right, according to the evidence of the quality of work that the process winds up producing, and not thinking about you know, a thing that hasn't been peer reviewed as not having sufficiently objective criteria for evaluation. And finally, um, I have been told by members of university, and promotion, uh, university promotion and tenure committees, not at this institution, not at my own institution, at other institutions, um, that an open peer review process or other forms of openly um, commentable work would doom a tenure candidate because anyone who participated in that process would be excluded as a potential external reviewer. 
Um, the intent behind this comment when it was made to me was objectivity, right? Any scholar who has had any contact with the candidate's work or who is engaged in any communication with the candidate or who has participated in projects with the candidate couldn't possibly be at the arm's length distance required to evaluate the work objectively. Now, this is not only a pretty um, dubious form of the insistence of op on objectivity, and I think a really highly destructive misunderstanding of the, <laughs> the nature of collaboration in highly networked fields today, and especially small highly networked fields in which everyone is working with everyone else all the time. I mean, I understand the impulse that, you know, we want to ensure that the judgment provided by an external reviewer is as focused on the work as possible without being colored by a personal relationship. Um, but there are degrees, and we need to be able to make distinctions among them. At my own prior institution, the line, and it was a very strong line, was one about um, personal benefit. Right? If a potential external reviewer um, had stood to gain in any way in their own career from a positive outcome in the review process of the candidate, um, so for instance, a dissertation director who would become more highly esteemed, the more highly placed his former students were, um, or a co-author whose work gains visibility the more um, her partner's career advances, and so on. I mean, these reviewers would obviously not have been engaged. But other levels of interaction really shouldn't disqualify reviewers, including co-participants in conference sessions. I've heard that, that these are folks who are sometimes eliminated from consideration. Um, commenters on online projects, like someone had mentioned to me. Um, members of advisory boards that the candidate also serves on, and so forth. In fact, I think a really key component of impact on a field is precisely about those kinds of connections, right? We should want our tenure candidates to be developing active relationships with other key members of the field and to be working with them in a wide variety of ways. And these relationships, you know, they should be disclosed in the review process, but they shouldn't be used to eliminate the reviewers who are likely, in fact, the best placed people to do the external evaluation. Um, of the candidate's work. So in the end, um, the key thing is really that the tenure review needs to be focused on assessing the impact that the candidate's work is beginning to have on its field and the confidence that impact to this point gives you about the importance of the work to come. And the ways that we understand and assess impact really need to be lifted out of those contradictions in which I think they've been mired. And we need to understand and appreciate that, that the tenure review process is and ought to be individual. Um, that it's, it's personal, it's subjective, and we need to seek ways of being equitable in our practices without trying to impose artificial and impossible forms of impersonality and objectivity. We, we really need to reorient our thinking away from what counts and back toward what it is that we value and why. And each aspect of the standards and processes that we bring to the tenure review process should be considered in that light. And are the measures we use, the evaluators we engage, the ways the work is being read or experienced, are, are all of these aspects producing the best possible way of thinking about how our scholarly values are being manifested in a career in process? And are they guiding us to the most responsible ways of considering that career's future? Um, so, Oh, okay, good. That is broad enough. Um, my uh, slides are available online. Um, it's kfits.msu.domains slash presentation slash whatcounts.html. Um, and I will circulate that URL again um, if desired. In the slides at the end, as I will show you now, um, there are a couple of uh, additional resources. Um, that I have linked out to. These are all of those um, disciplinary society guidelines that I mentioned and also the Emory and Nebraska policies in the event you want to take a look at those and um, see what's been done out there. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much. Um, thank you again to Martin for having me lead off and I would be happy if we have a few minutes for questions um, to take those. Um, you talked a little bit about the process that is uh, engages the scholar 
But we didn't talk about, or you didn't bring up, how the scholar feels about that, because I find sometimes people want to be as prescriptive as possible so they know what they need to do to achieve yes. tenure. And I also know that they're encouraged to do some things and then they get to that point and it's like, well, no, why did you do that? So the, the person themselves often feel conflicted yeah. as well about this process and how they can be they successful. Do. Absolutely. And I think that is important. And it is important to recognize, as you say, that a lot of times that drive toward a prescriptive, objective, clearly stated you know, list of what counts comes from the candidates who want to know, if I publish a book, am I going to be okay? Right, okay, then I will publish a book. Um, Absolutely understandable. One of the things that, that um, MSU has been doing, the College of Arts and Letters, um, is to institute a process. We already have an annual review process that's tied to our merit, uh, merit increases, right? So every year, everybody submits the work they've done that year. Um, they get a letter back from the chair after the policy committee has reviewed everything. And, and it, there's already this sort of built-in moment of continual check-in along the way. What we're trying to do is take that annual review process and think about it less in a summative way, how did you do this year, um, than in a, more in a formative way. Where are you headed? Right? Is this the direction that, that you know, your work might best head in? How can we support you in getting there? And with these frequent check-ins prior to the tenure review, I think we can begin to have a moment in which um, there's, there's a collaborative process right, between um, the, the evaluators and the candidate in really thinking about what it is they want to achieve, how well they're working along that path, and what, what the committee wants to see done. Um, by the time the tenure review comes up, that doesn't then have to define it in particular forms, you know, by discrete objects or a certain quantity of work that's going to make things okay, but that can make it more of a, a of a process of being shaped. Because I do think, you know, we find ourselves at a moment where a candidate can do absolutely everything that they were supposed to do. Um, they can, you know, produce all of the work and have things get caught in a year-long peer review process that delays the actual publication through no fault of their own whatsoever, right? They can have, be working with an editor at a press and have a book that is destined for publication and then the editor leaves and or the, the, the division of the press is shut down or the entire press is shut down and they've got to start over again. And the scholar has still done the work. They've done the thing that they were supposed to do. They just don't have the object to show for it. So what I'm really hoping is that we might find our way to a, a set of standards that are more negotiated and more negotiable and that really are checked in on frequently to make sure that you know we understand where you're headed and we like where you're headed and you know what you need to do in order to get there. Yes. Hi. I applaud all of your proposals. Um, and I was going to ask the question that the other person asked, but um, a, a corollary to that problem is that there are some intransigent faculty members who may not agree with all of these standards that I believe ought to um, reshape the PT standards. Um, in the case of the annual review, there are a limited number of faculty who serve on that, and they might be, oh, 20% of the faculty who will vote on that candidate. Mm -hmm. And um, as one can imagine, many faculty feel like they have the individual right uh, to assess uh, the candidate regardless of some of these decisions that they have not been party to. Um, I, what, do you, what do you advise in situations like that? I know you talked about educating the evaluators, yeah. um, but I'm, I, and this might be a matter of, of personality <laughs> transformation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, personality and institutional politics, um, I think, um, are, are key sticking points in this. I mean, you hear from, from 
not many senior faculty, but some senior faculty, that they had to do X and therefore everybody should have to do X. Um, or that, um, you know, maybe they didn't have to do X, but they really feel like everybody who came after them ought to have to do it. Um, so I, I think it's really important, and I recognize how tall an order this is, um, but it's really important to get everybody on board with this kind of transformation and to talk as a department about why it's important. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think having junior faculty who are doing innovative work start early in their careers presenting, having the opportunity to show that work to the department, to the college, to the university, to say, this is what I'm doing and this is the kind of recognition that happens when you do this other kind of work than what we, we normally do. Um, because I think that um, a lot of the resistance can be overcome by familiarity. Um, and a lot of it can be overcome by really beginning to see the, the sorts of impact that are possible for a department, for an institution, um, when the work becomes more public, whether through community-engaged scholarship or through digital projects that are openly available. Um, so it's, I mean, this, it, again, it's a tall order, and there are some people who are just never going to be gotten on board. Um, but figuring out, as a department, having the conversations that are necessary to say, we're changing our standards, we're changing our, 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 our standards to better reflect our values, precisely because we want these junior faculty to be doing this kind of work that's bringing recognition to all of us. Yes. I was going to ask about mentoring up, and if you could provide some examples of where you've seen that work well um, in terms of um, whether it's a formal process of assigning a mentor of, hey, we've got mm -hmm. this person. Because I know that often mentoring is such a, a personal relationship. Yeah. Um, and also requires, um, and so sometimes it feels like catch a sketch can, where like you get lucky and you find that yeah. person. And so I'm curious about um, if there are examples or critiques that you could provide. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to provide specific examples. Um, but I will say that I know of cases in which um, a junior faculty member who's been doing work that is not, you know, the norm for the department, you know, the department is an article-based department, or the, de the, the department is, um, is really focused on a particular mode of peer review and the scholar is working in more public forms or what have you. Um, who has just begun conversations with senior faculty to say, you know, this is the kind of work that I'm doing, and this is the impact that it's having, and this is the excitement that it's producing, and you can see how um, people are building on this work by looking, and simply those kinds of conversations, having the opportunity, again, to present the work, but also to talk one-on-one -on -one with senior colleagues about why the work is being done in this form can help. But the key component of the mentoring up bit, I think, comes, I mean, partially from the candidate talking to senior members of the department to say, this is what I'm doing and why I'm doing and I need your support as I'm doing this, but then from those senior members of the department talking to their colleagues and saying, I understand this project, I think this is super important, we really need to make sure that this happens. So it's. It's a matter of um, the, the candidate being willing to self-advocate, but also the people who um, have that candidate's back and who are willing to do more advocacy on the candidate's behalf. Maybe two more questions. Yes. Um, I have a question about um, kind of dealing with existing biases in the, pro in the process, because for instance, there's a really well-documented gender bias in academia, especially um, for women who have children, that that can be damaging to their career, even though they're doing the same work. So if you make the guidelines more subjective, how can you safeguard against those existing biases that are even more deeply ingrained? Because they're not just in academia, they're really systemic in our society. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if and this is one of the reasons why we've wanted our processes to become more objective and more neutral and more Accountable because that feels like it's going to protect against some of those biases. Um, unfortunately, I don't think in the end they actually do um, because the biases replicate themselves out through all other forms of, like the production of the things that we count um, has those same biases built into it. Um, 
we, uh, the processes that we develop as they become more focused on subjective judgment, our subjective judgment has to become more scrupulous and more, um, more a matter of, of more uh, treated with more self-examination and more willingness to critique um, the ways that we're going about that subjective judgment. We also, I think, and this is a really key part of, of what you're talking about, um, because there are not only those, those biases built into the process along gender lines, they're also along racial lines, along class lines, that we really need to think about what we prioritize, um, like what comes at the top of the form. Um, in terms of the kinds of work that we're producing and where the values of the individual candidate may lie. Um, a, a scholar who is very, very focused on producing very traditional peer-reviewed articles in a, a conventional format who is able to get them into the right journals um, may be doing really excellent work that has an impact within the field but may not have the, the desire or the need to bring that work out to the community or to connect with particular communities off campus in doing that work. And too often, scholars who do have that, that need, that desire, that interest in their work, have that work dismissed as being service, right? Rather than understanding it as being the focus of the research itself. So really rethinking um, what it is we're asking of scholars um, how we how we demonstrate our values in the prioritization of forms of work, um, I think, can help us in that process of self-examination and critique of the subjective processes that we bring to it. Right? Rather than more rigorously hierarchizing um, the kinds of, of things that we're counting, instead really recognizing that the counting process is always subjective and that we really have to step back and think more holistically about the candidate and, and the work that they've been asked to do. One more question. Yes. Um, during your discussion of the new modes of evaluation, it seemed to me that the teaching of a professor, the cataloging of a cataloger, the reference service of reference librarians has disappeared. Uh, is that your sense and that as we evaluate and decide tenure for faculty members in libraries or elsewhere, that that is becoming less and less a portion of, of what we evaluate. I think there are institutions at which those things have begun to get diminished. Um, or not begun, they have long been diminished. Um, there are many R1 institutions at which, you know, you need to be a teacher who doesn't get complained about. Um, but beyond that, spending more time on your teaching probably isn't going to help your case. And in fact, junior faculty get encouraged um, to, like, marginalize teaching in favor of research. Um, this, I think, for lots of reasons, is a mistake. Um, and I think that there are many institutions that are, that are walking back from that position, that are really recognizing that not only is the teaching what we're actually here for, um, but that the scholarship of teaching itself is really crucial to the development of a field, right? That what we're doing in the teaching process is expanding the field and its reach. Um, so I, I do think that um, there are places at which um, those other kinds of activity that you mentioned do fall out of the process and they don't get adequate consideration. Um, there are too many places where we only assess teaching through student evaluations. Um, and coming back to the question of systemic bias, um, student evaluations are rife with that kind of bias. Um, so we really need to be thinking much, much more about how we do that sort of evaluation as well. So thank you very much. Join me in thank you.